On Tuesday, March 24th, the Board of School Directors introduced Dr. Robert Fraser to the public in a public session held at Council Rock High School South. Dr. Fraser is the finalist for the superintendent's position in our school district. Dr. Barry Galasso, the executive director of Bucks County Intermediate Unit, moderated this question and answer session. The session was to be videoed for public viewing. Unfortunately, due to problems with our video equipment, we were only able to capture about 60 minutes of the 80 minute program. The large majority of the questions and answers are captured in this video. The opening introduction for Dr. Fraser and his closing remarks are the portion of the evening program that were not captured. We sincerely apologize for our inability to present to you the program in its entirety. Assuming students are number one, what would be your next highest priority as a superintendent? Um, I've mentioned relationships already. Um, I can probably broaden, broaden that piece a little bit. Uh, I've had a chance to read the comprehensive plan that's on the website. If you haven't had a chance to read that uh, at some point, uh, maybe if you have insomnia or not, uh, go on there and check it out. It's a, it's a dense document. It's a long document, but towards the end it gets to the, uh, the plan itself. It's the, it's the Pennsylvania template. Uh, there's good stuff in there. And part of what's good that's in there is, is some planning, some, uh, some goals, some, some desires that the school district has to do uh, some additional outreach to families, to the community as a whole. And those pieces, as I opened with, are just critically important. Uh, you have to have an engaged community. And, and when I say that, I don't mean just communication from the school district and pushing that out. Uh, that's a piece, and that's an important piece. And, and you could expect a heavy dose of communication from me as superintendent and from the school district as a whole. Uh, so you'll have listservs, and you have a Twitter account, and Facebook, and those sorts of things, uh, and, and all those conventional channels. But when I talk about engagement, I mean two-way engagement. So that when there's a message that is sent from the school district out to you as a parent or as a community member, I want you to feel very comfortable reaching right back out to the school district. You, know, you talk about this idea of an open door policy. Well, how does an entire school district have an open door policy? It's just a culture. It's a vibe. Uh, there's, there's this desire to, to work together, one heartbeat as a community, working on behalf of uh, the children here. Uh, so if you have a question, if you have a complaint, if you have an idea, we want to hear it. Uh, so that kind of language is in the comprehensive plan. It's important to me. Uh, and whether it's academic, whether it's fiscal, whether it's around technology, whether it's around pupil services, uh, any of the specific programs that we have in the school district, I think that would be the second piece. And, and I suppose that does tie back to students. Everything we do ultimately ties back to students. Uh, but I think that's also a separate piece from an action or orientation uh, that would be important to me and to my administration and our, uh, our team of employees here in the school district. There's been lots of conversation in the country and in Pennsylvania regarding the Common Core. The resident here says, I would like to know Dr. Fraser's opinion of the Common Core curriculum. Sure. Uh, I, I've, I'm asked that question a lot. Uh, it's my job in Westchester to oversee uh, what's called here the Pennsylvania Core. Um, I suppose I might revise the question a bit in the sense that Common Core is a set of standards. Uh, curriculum is something that you build locally as a school district and certainly it's a standards based curriculum uh, but in a district like Council Rock and frankly in a district like Westchester the standards themselves should never define the curriculum and why is pretty simple because we have really bright able capable kids here in this school district and down there in that school district so if we only teach the standards if we only teach to the standards I think we're shortchanging our or some of our students, in fact, many of our students. So, so we certainly want to develop a curriculum that is much richer and more robust than what any set of standards provides. So, uh, so the Pennsylvania core standards, uh, as you might know, they exist K-12 to in language arts, K-12 to in mathematics, and that's it. Uh, science standards, social studies standards, or still the Pennsylvania academic standards, the legacy standards. Uh, my opinion, uh, I guess it depends on what exactly the question is asking. If, if the question is the standards themselves, I would tell you that I am in agreement 
with the Pennsylvania Core Standards. I think the standards themselves are good. I think they've, la they've raised the level of rigor <coughs> for our students, uh, which I think is a good thing. And I also think that they accomplish what they say they're designed for, which is to be a connection to college and career readiness. I do believe that they do a better job of that than our previous standards did. Now, a big question is going to be answered here in about another month or so because our students in grades three through eight are going to sit down and take the PSSA assessments. And it's a revised PSSA assessment that for the first time is based on these new standards. Uh, did the state get it right? Did the state not get it right? Are our students going to be frustrated? Uh, is it going to be too difficult at certain grade levels? Don't know that answer. Uh, so that is a piece that's tied to the PA core. It's not a piece of the standards themselves, uh, but it's a piece that's tied to the standards. And, uh, and sometimes when I get asked that question, it's, it's about other pieces that are also tied to the standards. So, uh, and I think that you all know this narrative to some extent. Uh, the, the Common Core standards got tied in with no child left behind waiver. Uh, the standards also got tied in with race to the top federal funds. I think those are the more difficult pieces that are connected to the Common Core standards. Um, I find those pieces more difficult that are connected to it because I don't know, quite frankly, that we would have the Keystone exams as we do as a graduation requirement without that. I don't know that we would have the teacher and principal evaluation system that we have right now uh, that, that I'm also not a fan of uh, without that. But that, those aren't the standards themselves. Those are pieces that are connected uh, and politically got connected to the standards. So if you're asking me about the standards, I'm going to tell you I like the standards. I'm in favor of them. If you're going to ask me, uh, uh, Dr. Frazier, uh, Robert, do you like uh, all those pieces that are uh, tied to them, all those tentacles of them? I'll tell you that no, I don't. I hope that's fair. Okay. This is an interesting question. A resident wanted to know, which scientist, inventor, or innovator do you admire most and why? Good question. Um, I, was, I was anxious to hear the answer to this one. <laughs> I am going to go, and I suppose this will give a little insight into how, how I think and how my mind works. Um, I won't think so much of the, of the invention or the innovation uh, or that end of things, but it's more impact uh, for reasons that I talked about earlier. Um, I think I'll go with Milton Hershey. Uh, not because I'm a huge fan of chocolate, although uh, it certainly isn't bad. Uh, but it's, it's all the innovations that he had as part of his chocolate making enterprise and business uh, and, and much, much more importantly, what he did with that. When he created those fortunes, when he, when he made all the money that he did uh, and achieved all the success that he did and he created that school over there, the Milton Hershey School for disadvantaged uh, youth. Uh, that is thriving to this day, I think that's just an incredible, incredible thing. So uh, if the question is who I admire the most, it's really those kinds of traits that I think uh, I tend to admire. So uh, if it's fair enough, I think Milton Hershey Great. would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, one resident said that they were reading the website and uh, you've had an impressive growth in both uh, professional degrees and experience. And they went on to articulate being a principal and being a director and now assistant superintendent. And Council Rock has been used to stability. Yes. So the question is, uh, why are you leaving Westchester uh, after a short period of time? And how long, if you're selected as superintendent, are you committed to staying in the Council Rock School District? Great question. I, I think I addressed part of that already uh, with my uh, opening introduction here this evening. So let me answer that part first. Uh, I would not be making this move. Uh, this is more than a professional move for me. Uh, if all of this goes through, uh, I would be selling my house down there. I would be moving uh, much closer up this way. Uh, my wife, uh, who's in the audience here this evening, uh, we have some, some work considerations on that end as well. So, so I, I tell you that because this is a major, a major family decision and a family consideration, and uh, which is why I tell you why, why I said at the beginning, 
making this move, making this transition, my intent, as long as you all will have me, as long as the board of school directors will have me, is to one day retire from this place. Uh, I am looking to continue that legacy of stability. Uh, it, it's a tremendous legacy. I, I, I got to say, and I don't want to be remiss and let this evening go by without saying it, Mr. Mark Klein is a phenomenal, phenomenal man. I have so enjoyed getting to know him uh, here recently. He's a gentleman's gentleman and a true professional, and, and it's just truly been an honor and a privilege to get to know him. And uh, after the better part of four decades of service to this school district, he's leaving just enormous shoes to be filled by someone. Uh, and I would certainly love for it to be me uh, in the short term and in the long term, uh, because this is a fantastic place. Uh, so why leave Westchester? Uh, because a place like Council Rock exists. That's why. Uh, as I said, I've been in Westchester for about six and a half years now. Uh, I've been assistant superintendent for the past two years, director of curriculum and instruction for, uh, for about four and a half years before that. So uh, it's been a good run there. I would tell you that I love the Westchester Area School District. Uh, my superintendent is a fantastic gentleman with Bucks County roots. Uh, maybe that's why he's fantastic, I don't know. Uh, but he's, he's a good guy. The school district is fantastic. I'm a member of the board of the Chamber of Commerce in Westchester, so I'm involved in the community there. Uh, we have a wonderful group of parents down there. And as, I, as I've thought about my career, and look at, hey, where, where can you go? Where can you have this kind of impact that you're passionate about, that you get excited about every day when you get up in the morning? Uh, I look at Council Rock and I think of Westchester. Uh, and for me, that's a great thing. That's, that's a really, really great thing. Next question. Have you ever had firsthand experience with redistricting? And what is the best way to evaluate the capacity of a school for the purpose of redistricting? Uh, I have had firsthand experience. In fact, we are putting the, fin the finishing touches on a redistricting plan in Westchester right now. Uh, we've gone through this process for the past year or so. It's, uh, it's a K-12 to redistrict, although we have more students affected at the elementary level than we do the other two. Uh, it ended up being more of a spot redistrict as a wholesale redistrict. Uh, and so the, the scope of it even scaled back over the course of some time. And uh, I'll tell you that in some ways that's even more difficult because when you're one of only a few who are getting moved, uh, you tend to stand out more and feel isolated and singled out a little bit more. So, so some of that has proven to be uh, even more more difficult than a more uh, wide scale redistricting. Uh, but it's been a good process and it's clean at this point and right now we're at the phase of that process where it's all about transition. Uh, students are going to new schools next year, some students are grandfathered in, we have a whole transportation component as part of that, uh, but we're making sure the students gain a level of comfort and familiarity with the new school that they might be going to next year. And for us that was, that was strictly a capacity issue in one end of town. Uh, uh, one end of, uh, of the schools that we have there in the Westchester area school district. Uh, the second part of that was about evaluating capacity of schools. Uh, again, I I'm going to tell you that, that like most things, this is a team approach. So I can tell you that my experience in Westchester is uh, being involved in some of that work, uh, not quite honestly and transparently spearheading that work. Uh, so I can't tell you I have direct experience with it uh, from a leadership standpoint, but, but we have a director of facilities who is outstanding and we also contracted out with a company, uh, a demographer, who uh, is able to help us with some of that work as well. Uh, so when it comes to, to evaluating space and, and size and capacity and functionality, uh, you just have to consider the different kinds of spaces that you have have in the facility in the school so you have some common areas uh, you got a cafeteria and no matter how many students you put in that school, however much the rest of the school can handle, you have to make sure you can circulate them through lunches. Gymnasium for phys ed classes uh, and other common areas like that. Uh, you got just your traditional classroom space. Uh, so every school district has class size guidelines. Council Rock does, Westchester does as well. You know the square footage of all of those rooms and how many students can you realistically fit and how many should you fit from a functional standpoint in in each of those regular education spaces. And then a critically important part of this process is all the specialized programs that you have in your school. Some of the special education programs, speech and language programs, uh, and, and with some of these
these programs, you have different needs in terms of size and, and how those spaces are configured. So a learning support space in the special education program isn't going to look the same as an emotional support space or an autistic support space and certainly not as a life skills space. So you have to understand what those spaces functionally need to look like. Uh, you have a whole separate set of regulations on special education classrooms. Uh, the, the math isn't the same as it is for the regular education spaces. So, so you have to understand all that and think about how the whole school fits together uh, with your entire population, common spaces as well as the classroom spaces. And, um, and I think your analysis is, uh, is, based on, is based on that. How do you uh, consider taxpayers in general and the 70 percent of 60, 70 percent of the people in Council Rock who may not have children in the, in the Council Rock public schools, when you make a decision to close or open new schools, how would you, how would you reach out to these people to make sure that they have a voice in the process? Well, I'll say a couple of things, I guess. One is that wouldn't be the first time that we're reaching out. Uh, I think you asked the question, what, besides students, what's your top priority? So part of that top, top priority is reaching out right from day one. Uh, my first day on the job, I want to be out and about. I want to be meeting with, with, quite frankly, everyone that I can, every group that I can. And a lot of that's internal, but a lot of that is external as well. There are people in this community with tremendous talents, tremendous who are tremendous resources. And if they're not currently connected in a very active way with the school district, then I'm going to want to get those folks connected in an active way with the school district. So um, I think part of that outreach certainly is, is to those folks in the school district, which is the majority here in Council Rock, it is in Westchester, and in most districts who do not have children in the public school system. Uh, there will never be an issue that we tackle as a school district that, um, and let me say this in, in, in a twofold way, A, that people weren't uh, welcome to be part of that discussion. But as I mentioned earlier, this culture of invitation, this culture of engagement, this culture of just sincerity in wanting to partner and have active ongoing dialogue about the issues of import to this school district. Uh, I would hope that those conversations have been ongoing. I would hope that there was already a relationship there, a basis there, a foundation of trust there, because yeah, these, these are difficult issues and, and the school district has extremely complex and dis difficult issues coming up. And, and I can't tell you that when it comes to, okay, what's the, what's the bottom line, whether it's administration in the form of the superintendent or, uh, or if it's put to a school board vote, that everyone is always going to like the answer. That's not realistic. That's not the law of averages. Uh, and, and I think I can say no with the best of them. But I'll do it in a very empathetic way. I'll do it in a heartfelt way. Uh, I'll do it in a way that still tries to connect. And the one guarantee that I always give, whether I'm the decision maker or whether I'm asking the board to vote on my administrative or administrative recommendation, is that there will be a clearly articulated rationale for the stance that I'm taking. Uh, I owe that to anyone with whom I work. So, so that outreach will look like inviting people to be part of those conversations here in the district, and that outreach will also look like me hopefully having that relationship already established uh, with many individuals so I'm also able to go out to the community and engage in some of those conversations uh, in, that, in that kind of venue, that, that sort of forum as well. Okay. Let's shift a little bit to uh, student achievement. And one of the residents asked this question, how would you propose to increase the development of 21st century skills in the Council Rock students? It's a great question. Uh, and I, I liken I like in 21st century skills much the same way I do uh, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, and, and my feeling on it is, is it's not a time or a place or a person, it needs to be embedded throughout the curriculum because uh, you're talking about a big school district, you're talking about having 15 schools plus our Sloan School with people spread out and 21st century skills, uh, and some of this goes back to the testing conversation we were having earlier, Dr. Galasso, uh, the, the tests don't measure 21st century skills. They can't accurately measure 21st century skills. But if we're serious about preparing students for college and career success, for life success, for readiness of that sort, 
that we better be teaching and they better be mastering those 21st century skills. It's not about information acquisition. It's about having that information and being able to synthesize it and process it, make meaning out of it, apply it uh, to in a, pro in a sincere, authentic, problem-solving sort of way. Um, otherwise, I don't know what the purpose is to knowing the information in the first place, short of a Jeopardy game or, or something like that. That's, that's not what life is about. Life doesn't come to us in the form of a multiple choice test. Life comes to us in the form of situations, problems, obstacles. It's never about the knowledge. It's always about the application of the knowledge. That's what 21st century skills are about. So when that's not embedded into the curriculum, so students are experiencing this throughout language arts and mathematics and science and social studies and all their specials areas and elective areas, um, then I'm not sure that we're doing right by any of those various curricula. And I certainly know that we're not doing right by our students. Um, I'm pretty passionate about that piece. And I think that when a school district hones in on that piece, then in some ways, as educators, it gives us permission. Uh, we'll never be able to ignore the test because you got some cold, harsh realities associated with those tests, uh, unfortunately. But it gives us permission to take some of the spotlight, some of the focus off of them, and more on what we know is the right way for students to learn and what's critically important for them to, to be able to do when it comes to just living their life and being successful in life. So let me let me just follow up because there's another question that's very similar. And the resident is saying Council Rock has always been great at providing enrichment opportunities to students outside of the classroom uh, through extracurricular and clubs and so forth and so on. But that limits the number of students that are exposed to STEM. Mm -hmm. So she's going to, back to your embedded question about the curriculum. So can you assure this resident that STEM would be a priority if you became superintendent here in Council Rock? Oh, I think it has to be. Again, when you talk about what you stand for and what you're about as a school district, um, what's our job? What's our mission? Our mission is to prepare these students through a 13-year journey that when they graduate from our schools, they're prepared. They're ready. And, and certainly the vast majority of students are going to continue with their formal education uh, at the college or university level. Uh, and some students will go the trade school, technical school route, and that's wonderful as well. We want to support whatever the aspirations are of our students. And no matter what route a student goes, we know what the stats say. You read the same articles that I do. The job growth that's going to happen in the STEM fields is exponential. Uh, are they all going to require a STEM degree? No, of course not. Uh, nowhere close to it. So that I don't know that that's the end game. But the end game is understanding how you especially enrich the science curricula and the math curricula, uh, again, with an infusion of 21st century skills. And then you have this the, the engineering components of this that are so ready-made in, in certain curricular areas. Uh, technology education, even the art program can get into this. And then you have the whole technological piece, which, and you all know this, if we're not using technology effective, then the world is passing our students by. Uh, it's a tool. It's, it's a resource to be used, not unlike any other resource that we use, but so much of the world has already become technological, more and more of it is becoming technological, and so much more sophisticated within that technology, that if our st students aren't using those, if it's not embedded uh, throughout the curriculum, uh, then, then I'm not sure we're doing right by our students. So. Uh, short of, of giving a guarantee or a promise uh, because I don't even have a job offer yet. Uh, <laughs> yes, I think, uh, I think that's an expectation that would be reasonable and realistic. Okay. <laughs> the latest research regarding the amount of homework assigned does not correlate with improved academic performance, according to this resident. Yet our children, even elementary school kids, are spending an inordinate amount of time doing homework. Would you consider putting limits in place and enforcing those limits? Tough issue. Uh, we wrestle with this in Westchester as well. Uh, and I'll tell you that at the end of each year in Westchester, uh, we, we administer this survey, a stakeholder satisfaction perception survey. And so parents take it and staff takes it and you, you delineate all of that uh, to break down that data. And so one of the questions is about this issue. Uh, too much homework, not enough homework, just right. And, and there every single year, there is a certain percentage, and I don't know the number, uh, but there's a certain percentage of parents who say, you give too much homework, stop giving so much homework. 
And I'll tell you that every single year, there is just about spot on the same exact number of parents who say you don't give enough or students need or children need to have more homework. Uh, I don't know where the right answer is for sure uh, in Council Rock. I'm not here. Uh, I know that there's a board policy on homework. It, it doesn't speak to time. I don't believe, uh, as I recall, taking a look at that policy, the Westchester one doesn't either. Uh, there is, to, to the spirit of the question, uh, there is legitimacy to that question in terms of what is the value of homework especially at the elementary level. Uh, you can always find any literature or research to say anything that you wanted to say, uh, but I'll tell you, it is, it is fairly difficult to find a solid base of research to say that elementary homework in and of itself causes or even correlates with impacts on test scores or, or student achievement otherwise. Uh, that said, does that mean that it doesn't have any value? Uh, no, I don't know that that's what that means. Uh, certainly, if, if you take that, that research very literally and you apply it in a similarly literal sense uh, and, and you say, well, then let's just not have homework K to six and let's start at middle school in grade seven, well, the, the general traditional rule of thumb is about 10 minutes a night for each grade. I don't know that we want to transition our students from elementary school to middle school and go from zero to 70. Uh, that doesn't seem sound or wise or, or very child friendly to me. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of executive skills, executive functioning uh, components around homework as well. In in terms of, of just independence and, and being able to, to do that kind of work uh, at home. And uh, certainly, a well-designed homework has a place, whether it's practice problems because it's building truly off of not doing enough, not having the repetition in class, whether it's an extension, a meaningful extension of something you learned in class, or sometimes it's just preparation for something that's coming up in class. Uh, Well-designed homework, uh, I think, will always have a place and always have a place at all three levels, elementary, middle, and high. Uh, but would I be consider, uh, would I be willing to consider putting limits on it? Sure, I would. Uh, that's, that's a conversation I think worth having. Uh, as educators, it's worth having. And I think there's another piece to this that, that isn't in that question, and that's grading. What's the function of grading with homework, whether it's completion, whether it's accuracy? Um, I don't know that homework should count for any substantial part of a grade. Uh, really simply because you have students that come from different kinds of homes. Uh, some students have all the supports in the world at home, and some students don't. Uh, and sometimes that homework completion or accuracy of it can be a reflection of those kinds of pieces that are outside of a student's control. So I have in the past always limited the uh, percent of an overall grade that could be attributed to homework. So that's a little bit off the, the spirit of the question, but uh, given the topic, I'll share that as well. Okay. So um, a resident said, what's your stance on full day kindergarten? Doesn't sound like a loaded topic at all. No. <laughs> Full day kindergarten. Again, you uh, from a research standpoint. Uh, Clearly, you can find research to show the benefits of full day kindergarten. Uh, we've actually, in Westchester, begun to have conversations recently about uh, down the road adding full day kindergarten. And the reason being is because there uh, seems that there's going to be, going back to the capacity question, sufficient capacity across the 10 schools uh, to have the opportunity to do that. Uh, whether that would exist here in Council Rock, uh, I don't know. Uh, possibly, I, I don't know at this point, but I think the issue is is really threefold. Uh, one is just what are the academic benefits? What are the social benefits? What are just the overall developmental benefits? Uh, but then you always have a flip side to that as well. Uh, what's the will of the community? in this regard in terms of you know going from starting five years old, do I want to send my child to school full day or do I enjoy that half day experience and be able to ease in to the formal schooling? I think there's probably an argument and a place for conversation on both sides of that particular issue. Uh, second, of course, you talk about facilities. So overall, do you have the seats to double your kindergarten uh, footprint within the building. Uh, do you have that in all 10 buildings? If you don't have it in all 10 buildings, now mom or dad, are you willing to have your child go somewhere else for that full day kindergarten experience and then matriculate back to your neighborhood school for first grade? Uh, and then the third piece, quite frankly, is economic. 
Uh, I know uh, I was interested in this, so I, I looked this up specifically uh, because of some of the issues that I mentioned in Westchester. Here in Council Rock, there are, are roughly uh, 225 or so less students in kindergarten in the school district than there are in first grade. So where are those other students going? Uh, I have no idea what the answer to that question is, but I can tell you that in Westchester, that number is about 300 or 300 plus is the difference. And the answer down there, the vast majority, is that there is a charter school, a very large charter school in town, who offers full day kindergarten. So you have a number of parents who go there, of course, Westchester as a sending school district uh, is responsible for that charter subsidy and so you have a fiscal argument, a fiscal analysis there that if you bring that back to the school district and you bring any sizable majority of those students back to the school district, what's your net cost as you as you play all that out. So I don't know what those conditions are. I don't know what those realities are. As superintendent, uh, with any of our students, would I rather have them for a full day or a half day? Give them to me for the full day. Because uh, I told you I'm all about the impact. So the more opportunity you have, uh, the bigger impact you can make. Uh, but I think there's a will of the community issue with this. You've got a facilities issue, major facilities issues uh, coming up and planning that has already been underway. So that is a, obviously a key piece of this. And then you also have the economic drivers uh, behind this situation as well. Okay. A related question. Um, in this political climate that values high stakes testing, this resident wants to know how do you balance the needs of students and best practice, which often conflict with the demands of PA core and standardized testing? In other words, how can you support the teachers in not falling into the trap of teaching to the test above all else? Absolutely. It's never been more difficult. Uh, classroom teachers know this, principals know this, uh, central office leaders know this, but, but no one more so than that teacher, no one more so, uh, sadly, uh, than, than many of our children uh, and moms and dads of these children. It is a test-crazed environment. Uh, you have at the high school level the keystone exams where you talk about pressure on a child. It's, it's absolutely insane what the pressure is on some of our high school students and and with those regulations is take the test then go through supplemental instruction take the test again you can eventually go into what they call the project-based assessment which we have uh, a handful of students in the biology one right now in Westchester uh, to take the test itself is about three hours to take the uh, the project-based assessment is taken anywhere from 20 to 50 hours uh, depending on the student uh, just an inordinate amount of time then you throw on the new teacher evaluation system and principal evaluation system, some of which ties back directly to test scores uh, and growth of students, uh, something that the state calls PVOS, Pennsylvania Value Added Assessment System, that, uh, and I, I referenced this earlier, I will again, uh, quite frankly, is not the way that the system was ever intended to be used, and I will, um, I have, and I will continue to state that position clearly uh, and loudly, uh, because it's not fair to our students, it's not fair to our adults, and, and that's just not okay from a cultural standpoint within a public education school district. Uh, so you have all those pressures coming in. Uh, you have someone like me standing up talking about SPP scores down in, down in Westchester. Uh, I can tell you that when you talk about teaching to the test, I have zero appetite for it. Uh, now, there's a conversation there about what is teaching to the test. Uh, as students, when we were all in school, a lot of times you go in that day before and you get a study guide or you play a, a Jeopardy game or you know something like that and, and you do that little test review. I don't know that that is teaching to the test. Uh, that, that has happened for generations and generations. The problem is when you have this test crazed environment and you feel so much pressure and I think superintendents can create this pressure and you can also alleviate this pressure where it just becomes part of what you do all the time. So the format looks like the PSSAs or looks like the Keystone exams. All the language, we're always replicating that environment. Uh, and you can also teach to the test, as we talked about earlier, by narrowing the curriculum by sticking just to the standards, or worse yet, something that they call the eligible content, uh, that is the worst thing that you can do. Because it's not what school is about, it's not what the futures 
of our children are about. Uh, we're, we need to be about those 21st century skills. We need to be about STEM education and some of those issues that have been talk, talk, asked about. Uh, it needs to be about effective technology integration. Uh, it's not about narrowing the curriculum. It's not about teaching just what's going to be tested uh, because quite frankly, if you do that, you never get to the problem solving piece. You never get to the application piece because very little, if any of that, actually shows up on the assessments. Uh, and that's, that's terribly unfortunate. So I think it's my job, even now in Westchester, as the person foremost responsible for teaching and learning, certainly it would be here in Council Rock in the position that I would be in, uh, to set a tone that achievement matters without a doubt. Your property values in part depend on achievement of the school district. It will not be underemphasized. It will be important. It's a point of pride for me. I talk about the achievement of my school in Avon Grove. I talk about it with the 16 schools in Westchester, and I would want to be able to talk about it here in Council Rock. It's important, but it's not the be all end all. Uh, and we don't have multiple masters. We have one master, and that's the children that we serve. We do right by them, period. Uh, for me, that's the end of, end of the story. You do things the right way, and if you do things the right way, uh, the test scores take care, of them, take care of themselves. That's been my experience. Thank you. A uh, resident asked this question, how can we be assured that your leadership style will continue to a legacy of support, respect, and incorporating a teacher voice <laughs> into decision making because they believe uh, that doing that uh, pr promotes a climate of mutual respect, ultimately uh, benefiting the students. And I agree. Uh, if you had a chance to read any of my resume, uh, you read about Avon Grove. I think the language that I put in there was around teacher leadership, uh, informal and formal teacher leadership flourished. It was the model by which, quite frankly, we live by. Uh, had a chance at Penn to choose a topic for my doctoral dissertation. I chose teacher leadership at the high school level. What does it look like uh, at the high school level? Because my experience up to that date had only been uh, in the elementary and middle level. So I was curious about finding, finding that out knowing how important teacher leadership is. Um, I, I talked about it earlier this evening. It's relationships. That's what it is. Leadership is about relationships first and foremost. It's about the influence that you have on folks, and it's also about surrounding yourself with, with smart people, preferably smarter than you are, but then you have the leadership aptitude to maximize the power of that room. That's what, that, that's what a leader does. In a nutshell, that's what a leader does. And for me, uh, I mentioned previously, I'm very results oriented, very focused on outputs, not inputs. Uh, fanatical about that. Uh, I don't care where the idea comes from. It might be my idea, it might be from a parent, it might be from the school board president, it might be from a principal, it could be from a teacher, it can be from a paraprofessional. I don't care where the idea comes from. If it's a great idea and we scrutinize that idea and we're willing to commit to that idea and making it work and we believe that that is what's going to be most effective, then that's our idea. Uh, it's not about any one individual. It's about our students. It's about us as an organization. Uh, so by all means, the more that we get our heads together, the more that we work together and, and collaborate with each other, uh, to me, the better off we are. I, I'll tell you, if that wouldn't be a desired leadership characteristic, then I would tell you that I'm not your person uh, because that's the way I've always led. That's what I've grown to believe in as a leader is the effective way of doing things uh, in a public school, in a public school district. So uh, to me, it just it's what produces results. It improves morale, uh, enhances uh, faculty engagement, and all those things are very good things to uh, developing a positive culture and being a good place to work. But most importantly, importantly, producing the right kinds of outcomes when it comes to academics, social issues, emotional, behavioral, the overall holistic well-being of our students. Uh, when you have all hands on deck that are committed to that, that feel respected, feel valued, uh, authorship, ownership, all those buzzwords that I don't mean to use, but it's true, that's what it is. You give that voice. Uh, that's how that's how you get to the point of effectiveness. And, and the reason why, understand the dynamic of schooling. So let's say that we're in a room like this, I'm the principal of a school, and we're having a faculty meeting, right? Uh, at the end of the day, whatever we talk about, whatever we decide, tomorrow morning, you're going to be in your classroom. And there's, in high school, there might be 100 of you. 
right? So you got 100 classrooms, and the students come in, and they go to these 100 different places. Uh, I'm only one person. And my assistant principals might only be uh, three other people. So we can't be everywhere at once. What matters most, remember, is never the idea, but the implementation of the idea. So the implementers, those are the ones who are out there doing the work. Those are the ones teaching the students. So if test scores are going to increase, if we're actually going to be successful with those 21st century skills and on and on, it's going to ultimately be because of the work of that classroom teacher times 100. So if we can commit to that and create together, then when they run into difficulty in the classroom, and they will run into difficulty in the classroom because nothing, uh, or most things anyway, don't go easy, uh, it's their idea. It's not my idea. Hopefully it's our idea together. They're committed to it. They're going to make sure it works, so they're going to keep on pushing through. They're going to look for solutions and work for solutions. It's simple human dynamics. Uh, it's just it's the nature of public education uh, where you have folks working uh, individually with their students in the classroom. It, to me, it just makes sense, and uh, I think that uh, it's proven to be successful in the past. Council Rock has had a reputation for many years of being a district uh, that embraces inclusion for its special needs students, and they have delivered excellent education in a, in a, in a variety of forums. Uh, this resident would like to know, what is your experience with special education students, and what is your philosophy with regard to the whole idea of special education and how it's infused into the, into the uh, school district? It's a great question. Uh, Mr. Klein and I have talked about this issue uh, on the tour last week, and I was very encouraged by everything that he had to say. Uh, you talk about, let me take one step back. You talk about a couple of the things that I like about Council Rock. One is, and it's right in the mission statement, all students. And I see it sometimes, all caps and underlined and bolded, this, this emphasis on all. All means all without exception. It's about the growth and maximizing the potential of every single student. So that's one piece. The other piece is this focus on the whole child. Uh, I love the scorecard concept. If you haven't been on the website yet and checking that out, um, I think it's a fantastic idea because it's measuring uh, in an output sort of way the success of the school district, not just academically, but when it comes to extracurricular participation, co-curricular participation, uh, service learning through the LINCS program, and then you also have pieces in there around surveys and just perception feedback, stakeholder feedback. All those pieces uh, are critically, critically important. So. So I say that because when you think about the specialized needs of some of our students, uh, including students with an IEP, uh, to the maximum extent that we're able to include them, this inclusion model, within the regular education classes, with the regular education peers, uh, and make sure that the training for that transcends not just those special education teachers, but in a very real way, the regular education teachers as well. That's how we take care of those students. And in the school district, just like in, in Westchester, we have learning support here, autistic support, emotional support, life skills. Uh, we, we run the gamut, and it's a beautiful thing that all those programs are in-house. It's, it's very rarely, uh, from what I understand, that a Council Rock student is placed outside the school district. I will tell you that in Westchester, uh, they also run all those same programs in-house. Um, I don't know, though, that as many students stay in-house as is the case in Council Rock. It's very appealing to me as, as uh, a potential aspiring superintendent here because if, if you're going to talk the talk about teamwork and community and inclusiveness, I don't know how you do that, especially if all means all, and then you don't include those students uh, within the regular education program to the maximum extent possible. A, it's the law. It's, it's least restrictive environment law. But B, it's the right thing to do for students. So, so my experience is very much along the lines of what Council Rock does. Uh, I talked a little bit about Westchester as a building principal. Uh, actually had all those same programs within my building uh, as a middle school principal uh, down in Avon Grove. And uh, obviously uh, was able to serve as a local education administrator at IEP meetings and, and work with the parents and really just sort of shape that whole program and shape that whole culture there as well. So you mentioned a couple times in your answers tonight about the Sloan School yes. and the Achieve program. Yep. So this resident says she has a special needs youngster. How committed are you to those types of programs in the Council Rock School District? 
I'll say this. That's probably the biggest layup you're going to give me tonight. Uh, because uh, when it was time for me as, as a relatively young teacher to go for a master's degree, most people choose a topic that opens up some other door for them. Some go for administration, some might go for a reading specialist, but you know, some other certification, some other avenue that they can then uh, take their career in. I chose a field that didn't give me any of that. Um, it was a field that I was passionate about and passionate about to this day. And I just frankly wanted to be a better teacher than what I was at the time. So I chose to go for a master's degree. This is down in Maryland in uh, the education of quote unquote at risk students. So I don't know that I'm a huge fan of that label, uh, but I think that you all sort of get the idea behind it. Uh, the Sloan School is right up that alley. And I will tell you that in Westchester, there is, uh, the school district has also taken on its own school, just like the Sloan School, but the personnel for that are outsourced personnel. Uh, there's a provider who runs that program. The Sloan School here in Council Rock is one step better than that. Um, I love the integration. I love the focus of the program. Everything that Mr. Klein told me about it, we had a chance to quickly uh, stop in there last week on the tour. Uh, quite honestly, I mean, the fact that I went for that master's degree, I chose that education simply so I could become a better teacher. Uh, and, and I told a group of teachers last week that those skills, the ideas that I picked up uh, through that coursework made me a better teacher for all students, not just those that might be labeled is quote unquote at risk. Uh, and I believe strongly that they also make me a much more effective uh, administrator as well. So I am 100% I am on board uh, the Sloan School, the, the uh, Achieve program. Uh, I think that the benefits there, the fact that we can keep students uh, with us, uh, the Achieve program, the whole way up to age 21 for some of these students is, uh, is a very good thing. We own it. As a community, we own it. You talk about a community school, to me, that's what these programs represent. And, uh, and we should keep and take care of our own. And, uh, and that's, that's the legacy here. And I look forward to continuing it. Okay, let's talk a little bit about technology and its use in the classroom. And uh, residents are, are interested in your philosophy with regard to that and the use of technology in education. And would you foster an increased use of devices such as laptops, iPads, in the classrooms for assignments? And on a personal note, we have a resident who wants to know whether you're a Mac or a PC guy. <laughs> Interesting question. I think that uh, I've been now in the school district for about maybe 10 total hours, and that's the fourth time I've been asked that Mac <laughs> or PC question. Uh, Mr. Fredrickson's back there somewhere. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm PC uh, when it comes to computer usage. Sorry. Uh, however, if I pull out my phone, it is an iPhone. Uh, and if I uh, were to have my tablet with me, that would be an iPad as well. So I, I live in both worlds, uh, I suppose. Uh, increased usage. I, 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 I'm not tremendously familiar with the current usage, so I don't know that I can answer that question completely directly. However, I will cite once again and go back to the comprehensive plan, which is the strategic plan, uh, just a, a different term for it in the state, uh, for school districts. And I do know that one of the action plans, one of the goal areas, Areas and specific uh, tactics that have been established is around this very issue. So based upon that, I'm inclined to say yes, that we would be able to do it. Um, the use of technology is critically important. As I said earlier, however, it's not using technology for the sake of using technology. It's a tool. It's a resource, just like that piece of chalk up on the chalkboard is, or that dry erase marker up on the, on the ledge is, uh, just like a textbook is. When it's value added, you use it. When it's not value added, I don't want to see teachers using it just because. Uh, we don't need glorified PowerPoints and things like that at levels where students are operating at 10 times the sophistication every day when they get home. Uh, how is it value added? How does it enhance learning? How does it enhance the output, the creativity, uh, what students are able to produce and demonstrate their knowledge? That to me is the far more critical piece. So I know that uh, the comprehensive plan speaks to uh, bring your own device 
program, uh, and I think that's a great way of going about things, a very cost-effective way of going about things. We just have to, to make sure that we find a very effective and successful way of, of executing that. Uh, in the Westchester Area School District, uh, where I'm at now, I'll tell you that at the high school level, uh, they're going to a one-to-one -one model. Uh, and it actually goes down to eighth grade. So eighth grade students right now have a one-to-one -one laptop. Ninth grade students have a one-to-one -one laptop. Next year it'll come in for 10th grade, the following year 11th, and then the following year 12th. And students, once they enter ninth grade, uh, are able to keep that laptop for four years. Now, I wouldn't suggest uh, coming in here that that's a direction that we would head uh, if you don't need to because it's extremely costly. Uh, and everything is opportunity cost. Uh, there, that's the, the direction uh, that the school district is going. I would say here, if it's not necessary to go that direction, then you don't go that direction. Um, and I don't know that it would be necessary based upon what I know right now. But the important piece is using the technology, using it in value-added ways, a uh, ton of teacher professional development. Uh, that's, that's the biggest issue of all when it comes to it because not everyone's comfortable with the technology. And it's one thing to use it yourself and we run, all run into issues as individual users and we can fumble with it and we can figure it out and we can troubleshoot. Well, with something altogether different, when you're standing up in front of 25, 28 students uh, and it's not working well, you need to have that plan B. Uh, and even more so, if you have individual devices, whether they're tablets or whether they're laptops, uh, and they're not working for students, uh, you can have a classroom uh, go bad real quickly, uh, and we don't have that kind of time to waste. So, so there's a ton of infrastructure issues to make sure that what we have is working. You got to make sure that you have the tech support that's available to teachers, and then the teacher training piece is nothing short of critical. Otherwise, you have the devices and you have a plan, uh, but the implementation just doesn't happen effectively. Uh, and as you've heard me say already, I'm all about results. So if we're going to have a program, then let's be effective with that program or else let's not have the program. Okay, you actually answered the next question about the one-on-one -on -one, and uh, okay. did you have any personal experience and you just articulated that. So let's move on to something a little different. Uh, our resident asked this question, do you believe that online learning can play a larger role in the Council Rock educational program? Uh, I will need to learn more about what's happening right now to understand what larger would mean. Uh, I think that there's a place for online learning, yes. Uh, admittedly, however, there is a piece of me that becomes cautious when we're talking about purely online learning. Uh, I, I think the research that is coming out that has started to emerge uh, leans more towards a blended learning approach, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, as opposed to pure online. Some students will perform very, very well in a pure online model. Not all students will. Uh, it's, it's a learning style piece. Uh, I think it also speaks to the value of the classroom teacher. Uh, the research will tell you that the single most important variable that impacts student learning, and there is no close second to this, by the way, that is the classroom teacher. It's the quality of instruction. So uh, we just have to be mindful of that when we talk about full online programs. Uh, so again, I think for some students, it will work very well. It can work beautifully. Uh, but I think a school district needs to be targeted in that approach. Again, what most of the research has pointed to is more of this blended model, which what that looks like is that you have a hybrid experience as a student and as a teacher. So X number of days a week are online with the teacher moderating, and X number of days a week are spent uh, more traditionally in class. It might be two days, three days, three days, two days. It could even be four, one, or one, four. Uh, but part of that time is spent online, uh, independent, and part of that time is spent actually physically in class together. Uh, from a teacher standpoint, uh, I'll tell you, it's no less work to do blended learning uh, than what it is to, to teach five days a week online because the work alone to upload everything to whatever platform you're using is, is pretty considerable. And then the moderation of, of any chats that are going on, uh, you still go on there, you grade assignments, you get feedback to assignments. Um, it, it's actually a pretty significant workload. Uh, but we have gone in that direction in Westchester. We, we're going to be running 10 blended classes next year at each of our high schools. Uh, I mentioned the word consistency 
earlier, uh, we are running the same 10 classes at each of the three high schools. And, and there were some, some twisting of arms and some negotiating and some difficult conversations along that way to get a level of buy-in at each of the three schools that would actually result in success. Uh, but we sought out for five and we ended up with 10, so I think that's pretty good. Uh, but those students are gonna have their devices uh, and some are running four days a week in person, only one online. Uh, some of them are running three and two. Uh, what it's doing for our students, I'll offer this just as, as a reason why behind it, is we have some scheduling conflicts for some of our high school students. So trying to be student-centered, uh, you might have a, a one or two day a week physical education class, or you might have a, a lab-based science class that's a one day a week lab in addition to your five days of class and so you have these these single periods or these double periods that hang out there and take up a whole line on your schedule uh, so if we're able to now allow this student to have one day a week or a couple days a week in this online environment now you can match them up with those and thus solve some of these scheduling issues. So that was some of the impetus for us, but by no means was that the only impetus because, again, you need to be relevant. You need to be connected to the real world. I think uh, Council Rock sends 95% uh, or so uh, of students uh, onto college. If you think any students are going to college and not have some kind of online experience, uh, then we probably have our heads stuck in the sand a little bit. So, so relevancy is huge. Preparing students for college and career readiness is huge and to me that's that's just a piece of it okay uh, you you talked a little bit about this in your opening statements and answering questions tonight but one of the bedrock things this resident believes that all of her children have graduated from Council Rock and she believes that the communication here is just outstanding and you talked about relationship building and so forth and so on so I, I, I want to see whether or not you could add a concrete example of, of maybe a situation in Westchester where you had to communicate in a crisis or whatever, and, 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 and the kinds of things that you did uh, to articulate so that residents would be comfortable that that tradition of excellent communication remains. Absolutely. Uh, first, I'll say I'm not surprised. Uh, I've been subscribing to the listserv for the past uh, three weeks or so, and so I see some of the communications that come out through that forum alone. Uh, and just, uh, again, getting to know Mr. Klein a bit uh, phenomenal communicator in person. I can only imagine how he is with the community as a whole. Uh, rich tradition of excellence here with that, I am certain, uh, and, and a deep respect and appreciation for that. Uh, I would tell you that that will continue. Uh, I have no doubts about that, and I'll tell you that I'm confident in that because it's important. And it's important when the communication comes to you that it's transparent. Whatever, as superintendent, I would be able to share with you, I would share with you. And my experience is that the vast majority of information uh, can be shared with you. Uh, I want there, and some of this does speak to the relational piece, I want there to be this foundation of trust, this foundation of credibility that I know I'm not even starting to earn this evening, but come first day on the job, I want to start earning it that day. Uh, where when you hear something from me uh, and or when you hear stuff from the administrative team, building principals, classroom teachers, you can take it to the bank because it's accurate information, uh, it's, it's transparent, it's the truth uh, that, that you can just put stock into what you're hearing. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Pushing out information is only one piece, and to me it's not the more important piece. The other piece is being able to welcome feedback uh, and dialogue about that communication, or maybe just because you heard from us, it reminded you that you had something that you wanted to complain about, or an idea that you have, or whatever the case might be. So, so again, reach out to us. Uh, I think that's what a relationship, uh, quite frankly, is all about. So a crisis situation. Uh, I'll use an example of when I was a principal, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, I think it's a pretty good example of this. I, I had a situation where it was a Friday, uh, a Friday afternoon, uh, so not making communication any easier, where a student was found to have a weapon uh, on his person. Uh, it was a knife, it was a pocket knife, uh, and we have laws and regulations around this in terms of how big when it comes to expulsion and all that sort of thing, and, and it was large enough to make the student eligible for expulsion, seventh grade student, and, and to complicate matters, uh, not that it needed to with that, uh, but to complicate matters, there was um, a, a written communication that was discovered uh, that 
it certainly wasn't anywhere near explicit, but could have certainly been interpreted as somewhat of a vague or veiled threat towards a teacher. Uh, happened to be one of the students, teachers, uh, middle school teacher. So you had multiple issues there. So, so this came to light on a Friday afternoon. And so first you just, you manage the situation and you take control of the situation and you do all those things from both the student end of things as well as the teacher here uh, who, who, if in fact this was a threat, uh, would have been the, uh, the victim in this case uh, or the, the, the target in this case. So, so you handle all those pieces and, and now you need to communicate. Uh, because this isn't the kind of community where, where this happens. Um, and, and the last thing that you can afford to have happen, and I think this speaks to the spirit of the question, is, is for rumors to be out there or misinformation to be out there. So, so I had been at the school for some time, and I think that I, by that point, was able to build up that trust and credibility that I was talking about. So what happened was, uh, certainly communicated internally first, pulled the staff together and sent them home so that they could be key communicators when questions came their way over the weekend. Uh, but, but I put the written communication out to all parents uh, in the school and they also did a phone blast. Uh, so that they could hear my voice, hear my tone of voice, assure them that all students are safe, no students were ever in jeopardy of not being safe. Um, I shared with them what I could, which wasn't everything um, per law enforcement, but I shared the maximum extent that I could, which was plenty enough to give them a sense of the situation. And then what I did is I told them on a Friday evening, um, I'll be in the office until 9 p.m. Uh, I refuse to leave. If any uh, reporters, TV camera, what, if anyone's going to show up, I'll be here. I don't want to run from this. I don't want to duck from this. Uh, I, want, I want to be available and I want to be able to manage and control the situation. Uh, but more importantly to the parents, if you're uneasy about this, if you're not sure about this, uh, if your child comes home and they're not sure about this, I'll pick up my phone, here's the number to my direct line, how to reach me. Uh, if you want, just drive on out, um, I'll meet you at the door, we'll come in and we'll talk. Uh, to me, it was important to handle it in that sort of way. Um, it would have been important on a Tuesday evening. It was especially important on the Friday evening, heading into a long weekend, to try to control anxieties and fears and just some of the human nature that can take over in a situation like that. Um, so I hope that answers that question. It does. Yeah.